Good morning. I've had a lot of caffeine and a lot of sugar this morning. I did eat an egg, so I've had some protein too. But um, it's great to be with you guys today. We had a great Sunday last week with Mother's Day. Um, we had a dedication of little Araya Vinzant. That was wonderful. And uh, if you missed it, you can check it out online um, on YouTube or, or our website. But uh, it, it was really an awesome time to be together. How many of you uh, can see what's up here? Okay. So we got, we got an array of items here. Um, helmet, uh, body armor, uh, shin guards. Uh, you know what I didn't bring? <sighs> Can't believe I didn't bring it. A belt. I, I need one today, too. I, I don't know what's going on there. But, but uh, I even I got it out. I just totally spaced it. Do what? Oh, and sword. I don't have a sword. I don't really have a sword, though. Um, but you, use your mind's eye, okay? Um, all right, so what, what do we use items like this for? What are they for? Baseline. Yeah, protection. Uh, it keeps us safe. Um, what other kind of things do we use to protect ourselves? Um, like, like we got shoes here. How many of you wear appropriate to the task shoes? Whenever you're going to do something, you, you wear um, the great theologian, Forrest Gump. Um, he's, he said, my mama always said you can tell a lot about a person by their shoes, where they're going, where they've been, right? How many of you wear a seatbelt? Very good. Uh, wouldn't have been too many years ago that we would ask that question and not everybody would have raised their hand. Um, how about an owner's man manual? Anybody ever needed to read one of those? Uh, anybody ever needed to read one but didn't? <laughs> yeah. Um, you have your, how many of you have actually worn a, hel a helmet for something? Motorcycle? Um, Riot control, <laughs> anything, baseball, okay, cool. Um, anybody ever worn a, a tool belt? Some kind of belt. Uh, what about body armor? Anybody worn body armor? A few of us, okay, very cool. Um, so today is a fun day. We're going to start a new series. Um, for the next eight weeks, we're going to be uh, finishing up the book of Ephesians. We actually started that book at the beginning of the year, and then we took a break for the time around Easter, and uh, uh, we looked, you know, really pressed into to the resurrection and love reigns, um, and now we're going to go back and we're going to finish that book out, but we're going to take more time on this one uh, area of scripture than we did for a lot of the rest of the book. I, I think it bears mentioning um, why we're doing that. I, I think that we live in an unprecedented time of, of a lot of conflict in our world, and sometimes our, our response in the church gets misdirected. We, we mistake who the real enemy are, is uh, of us and our souls, and so we're going to talk about that and then how God equips us, because sometimes we walk into battles thinking that God has equipped us for this particular battle, and it's not the right battle. Like, like it's, it's, you showed up to the wrong one. Um, and so we're going to talk all the way through that uh, over the next eight weeks. Uh, if you want to look at the, the earlier series, that's on our website. The, the title of the series is new, so if you just look for the picture and you start through that series, that'll get you up to speed on kind of where we're at. Where we're at. Um, okay, so what we really want to press into today uh, is we're going to be talking about the enemy, okay, a lot. Uh, the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, if I'm going to recap a little bit, so that's where we're headed, but, but as we recap, the Apostle Paul talks a lot about the theology of salvation in Christ in those first three chapters, our place in God's plan, what it means to be saved, what it means for, for us in just this life that we have here. And then the next three chapters of, of the book of Ephesians are what it looks like to live it out, how we live in community in the church with each other. Um, the old us versus the new us, and then how Christ comes in and he changes us from the inside out, and we then live that out together in community. And then in this last chapter, chapter 6, as Paul is wrapping up how it looks to live this salvation out, this side of heaven, he uses the idea of armor to describe how God equips believers to live out the plan that he has for their lives. You can find that, uh, the, the, the idea that God has a plan for you in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. But God actually equips that plan. And to experience the power of the salvation that you have in Christ, not only has he equipped you for the plan, but he tells you to suit up. 
And that's what we're going to talk about over the next eight weeks. So for this Ephesian church in the first century, that sexual immorality was rampant. Idol worship was rampant. Humanism and occultism were rampant. Uh, philosophy and ideology of, of self-indulgent was rampant. Slavery still existed. And families were fractured by all of those things. All that other stuff. And in the middle of that, Paul uses this armor imagery. And we've got to understand why Paul uses the imagery that he does here, the imagery of a soldier equipped for battle. And before we can get into the armor itself, we've got to understand why it might be necessary. Why would Paul say it this way? Why would Paul say you need to know about the armor of God? Now, here's the thing. I know up front that, that, that sometimes the armor imagery or the idea of battle or war or any of those kind of things, that can be disturbing to some folks, and especially folks that have been exposed to those things. And how could it be that, that a loving God would be equipping quite, uh, Christ's followers with this kind of imagery? But it proves to illustrate a very important point before we even get too far into learning today. That God's love and God's grace and God's mercy are at absolute war with the devil's hate and rebellion and lies. And that war is for you and me. It's for the human soul. The Apostle Peter talks about the devil this way in 1 Peter 5, 8, that he's prowling about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The devil has all kinds of tactics, mainly confusion, sleight of hand, distrust and doubt. And so we end up like Paul, the Apostle Paul himself. He writes, uh, as he's trying to follow Christ, we find this in Romans chapter 7. Paul says, For that which I'm doing, I don't understand, for I'm not practicing what I would like to do, namely follow Jesus, but I'm doing the very thing I hate, namely sin. And so Jesus said this to the devil in, in John 10.10. 10. This, this, is, this is who gets us into that kind of confusion. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and might have it abundantly. Now, sometimes in churches, we don't talk enough about knowing the enemy of our souls. Sometimes churches even teach that there is no real devil, there is no real Satan, that, that he's a metaphor. Or sometimes we think that if we talk about the devil too much, it gives him too much airtime, gives him too much power. But, but the thing is, I think sometimes we do that on an operational level anyways, precisely because we don't talk about him. And we don't talk about the limits of his power. I want to read here, uh, as Paul introduces this area of spiritual battle and our enemy here, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be in verse 10. Finally, so this is Paul's final word on everything else he's talked about. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So this warring for our souls, that's not to say that, that the, when we look at the devil and all the different places that we see him, and we could expand each one of those and spend, we could spend a whole year on this one passage. Um, but it's not to say because we give him maritime that somehow the devil is God's equal, but only on the bad side. He's not God's equal. The devil is a fallen angel who chose to rebel against God. The devil had a beginning. He was created. He's not eternal. He's not everywhere all at once. He's not all powerful. He's not all knowing. Now, if you want to read deeper on that, read the devil's interaction with God at the beginning of the book of Job or his interaction with Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew 4. One thing we do know about the devil is he hates God and God's creation. That includes us. He hates you and me. And he's bent on our destruction. He's bent on our alienation from God. But he isn't equal to God. Now, the thing is, though, just because he's not equal with God, he is really, really powerful. Okay, he, He's more powerful than, than a lot of angels. Um, he, he's more powerful than, than us as people as far as one-on-one -on -one goes. That's why we talk about armor and the things that God equips us with. He's intelligent. He's influential. He can appear beautiful or tempting. He's described as one who disguises himself as an angel of light in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 
Now, because of that, a lot of times what we do as people, what I do, is I give him way more power in my view of him than he actually has. And, and part of the reason, the, the ugly truth of that is, is we see it in the Garden of Eden, actually. We like to shift the blame, right? How many of you, I mean, if, if, you, if you were super honest in this moment, how many of you would rather shift the blame to someone else than take it yourself? You know, you don't even have to teach a little kid that, right? Uh, do you remember, fa- this goes back a ways, but the, the little cartoon Family Circus? And there was this little clear thing that was known as not me. And so it would show up in the cartoon and the, the mom would ask the little kid, did you do this or that? And he would say, not me. And you see little not me, he's, you know, getting into the cookie jar or whatever. We, we love to shift blame. It goes back to our first parents. How many of you know this phrase? The devil made me do it now here's the thing about that phrase it shows up in tom and jerry cartoons too you got the little the little devil and the little angel on either side there right uh but what happens is it lets us off the hook right i mean we we get to blame it on the devil now here's the thing about the devil the devil is absolutely i'm going to use a food metaphor because obviously i like food but but the devil is the master of the smorgasbord of sin. He's, he's the master of the lunchroom of lies. He's the master of the cafeteria of carnality. He's the master of the buffet of brutish behavior. But we hold the menu. We make the choices. The devil didn't make us do it. He enticed us. But we're led away of our own lust, as the book of James says. So we have this imagery in the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, and we have this armor imagery, and we're seen as soldiers, kind of like the old hymn, uh, Onward Christian Soldiers. Anybody ever remember that hymn? Or there was another one that popped in my head this morning, Soldiers of Christ Arise and Put Your Armor On, right? Uh, we, We have a lot of those. It's actually banned in some songbooks now. Uh, the, those songs because they talk about armor and that's seen as militant and, and how dare we talk about militant things except that the Bible does. So that's how we dare to talk about these things. The Bible tells us that we are, in fact, engaged in battle and that there is an enemy of our souls, that there are sides to this thing. There's, there's two sides only, which greatly simplifies it. We're either on God's side or we're not. The book of Ephesians uses the word formerly a lot when describing who people are before Christ. And so formerly, we walked in a certain direction. And it was the wrong direction. And then Christ changes our direction in salvation. And and the enemy hates that. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthian church said this in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of strongholds. So I got to tell you, if you didn't know it before today, you are smack dab in the middle of a battle. You have an enemy, but you also have a savior, an armorer, a general, a leader, one who has gone before you in battle, if in fact you are in the faith. Now I know I said a fun day. And, and I know when we start talking about devils and, and enemies and things like that, it can, it can feel a little heavy. But i got to tell you, this is fun for me to start a new series and think about what it looks like for us to be equipped as believers. And not only equipped, not only is, is the armor there, but, but we're by the, by the end of this eight weeks, we are suited up. Okay, That's what's fun for me. The other thing is, I think you're going to enjoy our special guests Uh, over the next eight weeks. The children's ministry has taken a break from their regular curriculum, and they won't be in here today, but they're going to help us in this study of the armor of God. They'll be joining us from time to time to help us visualize things a bit. So I think that'll be a really good thing to help us get this stuck in our heads. And it is extremely satisfying to learn how to navigate this life the way God would have us navigate it. I mean, you and me, we want to know what he's doing in our lives, don't we? So for today, I really want us to understand the enemy and the imagery, though. It's not the imagery of the Crusades. I I like movies about the Crusades. I like to read about them. Uh, They they show a lot about um, uh, different aspects of human nature, um, 
dedication, all those kind of things, but, but what, what a mess those battles really were in, in hindsight. It's not the imagery of the Crusades, nor is it the physical enemy that the church fought during the Crusades. We're always going to come back to this point that our battle is a spiritual one. And so the armor that we're going to discuss is spiritual. Now, now our spiritual battle will most certainly cost us here in this present physical existence. That's been the way of Christianity since Christ. But it is fought first in the hearts of all who profess Christ as Savior. And for all who profess Christ as Savior, God provides adequate defense and even offense as needed. I, I gotta, uh, I'm going to go off notes here for a second, so take a second. I'll, I'll come back, though. Um, one of the things that I liked about being in uniform is during training, uh, when I was a policeman, every piece of uniform was tested. There was a purpose to it. And when you saw that, let's say uh, you had your shin guards on, and somebody come along with a, a PR-24 stick, and they hit those shin guards. And once you realize, hey, you know what? You hit me all day long right there because I'm, I'm armored up. And then somebody whacks you in the head when you got a helmet on. And you're like, hey, I'm still in the fight. Yeah, he hit me, but that didn't take me out. I'm still in this thing. And so I come to rely on that equipment. Your gun belt was always the, the thing that, I mean, it held everything together. And we'll talk about that over the coming weeks of how it just held everything together. And everything that I really needed in an instant was right there. And, and I loved that that comfort of knowing that I was actually bigger than I was, okay? Not in a prideful way, but like I, I can handle what comes at me. And I think God wants that when we read how Paul treats this, that's what God wants for us. He, he needs us to realize that we are bigger than we are. Not because it's us, it's because of what he's doing in us. Now, I didn't do it on purpose that it's warm in here, that I'm talking about the devil and stuff, but um, have we turned the air conditioning on a little more? Can we get it a little cooler in here? Anybody else warm besides me? Okay. Uh, Hank, could you? There's a one up here. Whew. But I think you guys are warm too, right? Yes. All right. Uh, so, Hank, could I trouble you to turn that one down a little bit? Make it, make it a little cooler? So God provides this, this defense, and we, we see it in, in regular life, in our current life, of what that's like to have armor that works. And that's what God provides us. Now, here's the thing. What if I had those, those shin guards or that helmet, but I chose not to put them on? The equipment was there. What happens if somebody hits me in the head? I don't have my helmet on. I get my skull cracked, right? Or, or they hit me in the shin, and I don't have that shin guard on. Well, I'm not going to be walking away from it very well, right? Okay? So just because we're equipped, if we don't suit up, doesn't really do us any good. Okay? Now, ultimately, when we talk about the armor of God, the provision is Christ. It really is Christ that we're putting on. The armor, that, the, as Paul walks through it, is really a metaphorical breakdown of what it looks like to put on Christ. Paul's letter to the Roman church in Romans 13, 12 through 14, he says, The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Now, putting on Christ here implies a battle against those things mentioned here. It, it, it implies a battle. The, the deeds of darkness he lays out there, um, uh, carousing and drunkenness. So, so that's uh, the, the, the party it up, you know, uh, for, for tomorrow we die kind of idea. Uh, sexual promiscuity and sensuality. I don't think I need to explain that to anybody. If I do, let's talk after. Uh, not right now, okay? Um, sensuality, strife, jealousy. Those are the deeds of darkness. And over and against that, the armor of light is putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. 
You see, that's the other thing that a soldier can't do, and, and, and Jesus talks about that too. Um, we, we can't be entangled with all kinds of other stuff when we're on mission with God. Putting on Christ looks like putting off other stuff. Now, here's the thing. I think that, that these kind of passages blow away the idea that all I got to do is say some magic words and now I'm saved. Somehow God's going to read the obituaries when I die and he's going to say, oh, well, I got to let him in because he was a member of this church or that church. He was a great guy according to the obituary. I mean, I never really saw him. I didn't really know who he was. He was never really in church, but he was a member there. He, he didn't really serve, but I mean, the obituary, it, I got to let him in. I think that when we read passages like this, that saving faith, that our, that our true belief in the resurrection, the confession of the mouth that Jesus is Lord, it is operational, it is meaningful, it is visible. It is demonstrative, that's easy for you guys to say, demonstratively continual. And over and against all of that, the enemy wants you naked and exposed. Remember the Garden of Eden? One of the first things Adam and Eve realized after eating the fruit that God had forbidden them to eat is that all of a sudden they knew they were naked and they were exposed. Now, not only because they were physically naked, but now they were totally exposed by their actions. The word Satan in Hebrew means accuser or adversary. His goal is to expose you as sinful. His goal is to expose you as unworthy of God's affection. His goal is to expose you as on the wrong side of God's justice. Because the enemy wants you sentenced to death. So naked and afraid, that was Adam and Eve. And so often it's you and me too. And God makes a covering. He made one in the beginning for Adam and Eve with the skins of animals. He makes one for us in Christ by the blood of his son. And we put on Christ. And God makes, no, or, or God makes provision for our victory, even as we're instructed to make no provision for our defeat. Anybody in here struggle with um, sugar or diabetes or anything? So if you struggle with that, is it a smart thing to load up the pantry with Oreos? No. That's an example of what making provision for the flesh looks like on a basic level. God tells us this stuff's going to kill us, and yet oftentimes we stock up. And we think, well, this is going to help my willpower. See, I won't eat those Oreos. But given weakness and time, what are we going to do with those Oreos? We're going to eat those Oreos. We're going to buy a gallon of milk. We're going to sit down and... And here's the hard part. And this, this hurts. This stings me. But we're not being bad. We're actually courting death. I know that seems kind of harsh and, and a little bit mean bringing Oreos into this whole thing, right? I mean, you're not going to look at Oreos the same way twice now. At least not today. But, but what if we had armor against Oreos? And I'm not talking about metformin. Uh, what, if, what if we actually had, had armor? What if we had help in the fight against Oreos? Nehemiah, um, we're going to study him uh, when this series is over. We're going to start a study on, on Nehemiah. But in the Old Testament, he's, he's up against a foreign army that's taunting his efforts to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he says simply, our God will fight for us. How many of you believe that today, that your God will fight for you? Maybe an army isn't taunting you like it was Nehemiah. Maybe, maybe Oreos aren't even taunting you. But you and me, we know what it's like when we feel like the heat is on. We know what it's like to be in the battle. I love this example from the Old Testament. It helps cement the spiritual battle imagery as well as God's provision. We see in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament there, we have Daniel and we have his friends too. Um, these are all Jewish young men taken captive when God disciplined the Jewish nation for walking away from him. 
So, so God used the Babylonian nations and, and specifically this, this king called Nebuchadnezzar and they took the Jews captive. And this was a long captivity, 70 years before the Jews would be able to return to Jerusalem. And even then, they returned as a conquered people. Nehemiah was on the forefront of that, uh, by the way, uh, as part of that return and rebuilding um, thing. But anyway, may, maybe you've heard of Daniel. Anybody heard of Daniel in the lion's den? Yeah. Um, that's probably the most popular event from his life as far as name recognition. But Daniel and, and his friends, because they didn't adopt the ways of the Babylonians, God continued to favor them and put them in strategic places. So there was these three guys, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and, and they rise in the ranks. And it really ticks some of the other Babylonians off because these three guys have more power as slaves than many of the Babylonians did as free people. And so this perfect storm is brewing because Nebuchadnezzar, he makes this golden statue. And this thing is huge. It, it's, it's about 90 feet tall. It's about nine feet wide. And it's made of gold. It's, you can't miss it, right? It's, it's not some little thing that you put off in the corner. This thing is front and center. And everybody was, was required to bow down to this thing whenever the music played. That was the deal. No matter what your own religious preference was, you were to give Nebuchadnezzar as the head of state. He was the head of religion. He was the head of everything. You were supposed to give him your undivided devotion. Needless to say, I don't think that the Babylonian constitution had a First Amendment, really. It was just this complete trust in the government no matter what. That, that was what was required, and, and, and the king had final say. So the three young Jewish men, uh, they'd been consistent in their devotion to God, and so they didn't bow down when the music played. And those jealous Babylonian guys, they got wind of that, so they rat out Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Nebuchadnezzar summons them. And the Bible says that when Nebuchadnezzar summons them, he's already mad. He's in a rage. And so he gives them a choice. You bow down like everybody else does. Everybody else knows the drill, guys. You, you must have something mistaken. Uh, you got to have a cog loose or something. Just do what everybody else does and, and it'll be okay. Or I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had already made this choice at least once because they got ratted out. They hadn't bowed down before, and so they had always been in danger of this furnace. It's interesting that, that Nebuchadnezzar made the furnace, or, or maybe he had it on hand, but he had this thing stoked in anticipation of people disobeying. That's interesting when you think about how their structure was. Or maybe, for such a time as this, God said, you know what, I'm going to provide the wood. You just wait and see what I'm going to do. But they were always in danger of that. They were never going to comply. But here's the thing. It was right in front of them now. The heat, the heat was literally on. The enemy wanted them to crack under pressure. The devil wanted them to renounce their own God and worship Nebuchadnezzar or burn in the process. And it is obvious that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego know who this battle really belongs to. Daniel 3, verse 16 through 18, they answer Nebuchadnezzar, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Now, if you're the king, that's immediately going to tick you off. Because, you know, if I'm the king, yeah, you are going to give me an answer. They go on, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You see, these three guys were absolutely convicted to their core that the battle belonged to God. They're, they had a completely undivided heart. Their heart was complete in knowing that he could save them from the fire. But in any case, they knew they would be delivered. They knew that that fiery furnace wasn't all there was, whether they walked out of that or whether they met God for the first time face to face. They knew that physical death was not the end. So either way, they had decided in their heart ahead of time they were not going to crack. And this infuriated the king. And he had the furnace heated seven times hotter than normal. It's so hot that the guys who are supposed to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the flames are killed themselves. 
I mean, these guys are friends of the Babylonians, right? They, they, they probably are Babylonians. They are soldiers in the court. And it's seven times hotter. They're supposed to throw these three guys in and they die too. It's interesting how in a godless culture, human life means nothing to the rulers. Even when those lives are seemingly on their side. Because here's the thing, evil doesn't care who it destroys. So these soldier guys, they burn up just getting close to this thing. The Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they're fully clothed and they're bound. They fall into the furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and instead of three guys, he sees four. Four who, this furnace must have been big because this is four that are walking in the midst of the furnace and, and they're walking free and one of them in Nebuchadnezzar's own words, is like a son of the gods. I think some translation says like a son of God. And there's also a great theologian from Veggie Tales that says, and one of them is real shiny. The rest of the story, the king sees this and he calls the men out and, and only three of them come out. And they don't even smell burnt. Their bindings are gone. That's the only thing that got destroyed is the thing that was binding them up. And at that, the king recognizes that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was not to be spoken against, that, that their God was mighty enough to save them from the flames. And not only was, was he mighty enough, but he had done it. Now, here's the thing. The three young men, they were prepared to live or die. They knew the battle was God's either way. But that what they did know, they knew they would not disobey God. They would not dishonor God. How many of you or me, if we were faced with a similar situation, might think, you know, if I live, then I can tell more people about Jesus later. These guys had a settled heart. They knew that the battle belonged to God and, and they were clothed in obedience. And this is before Jesus came well, I mean, maybe. But they were clothed in obedience and devotion to God. When we think about the war that we're in, we might not see fiery furnaces, but there's definitely evidences all around us of strongholds, as the Apostle Paul would say. Strongholds that the devil, the enemy, wants to keep people deceptively locked inside. Anybody in here ever been locked inside one of the devil's strongholds? What's it feel like to be free? Can I hear you say amen? amen? I think it's, it's amazing that the only thing that was burnt was their bindings. Because see, that's how Jesus fights for us. In the midst of temptation, in the midst of a trial, in the midst of pain, in the midst of a godless culture, Jesus removes the bindings and we can walk free in the middle of the fire as long as we walk with him. The fire can't consume us as long as we walk with Jesus through the flames. Are you free? There's no doubt you and I walk in a culture of choosing to avoid the fire by walking with culture. Or we can walk through the fire choosing to walk with God. There's no doubt that there's an enemy who wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy you morally, spiritually, and physically if he can get to you. And our enemy was not born in this world, but he, he is in it. And he hates God and he hates you. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What's that look like for us when we believe, we put on Christ, we put off the old us. That's really the bindings, right? I mean, I, I'm... The old me is what holds me back. That's what holds me down. That's what keeps me bound up. But we put on Christ and the bindings fall away. In the battle, to be ready for the battle, we suit up. We put on Christ. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. I really want to ask you, I want to challenge you to be here every Sunday for the next eight weeks. If, if you've gotten kind of in a habit of, I come a couple of times a month or whatever it might be, I get it. Okay, especially over the last couple of years, it's kind of cultured us to that. I want to encourage you to be here. Um, I want to see where this series takes us as a body. I firmly believe that this wrap-up of the book of Ephesians deserves all the time that we're going to give it over the next eight weeks. Now, I want you to read the passage, Ephesians 6, uh, 10 through 18, 20, somewhere in there. Uh, I would say go ahead to go to 20. And as you get dressed every day, think about what it would be like to put on Christ in this way, to be, to be ready for the battle that comes at us moment by moment. So when you're putting on your shoes or you're putting on a belt or, or you're putting on your shirt or whatever it might be, think about that. Think about the enemy and how much he can't do and be equipped by God to fight. If today was... Uh, was difficult for you if, if thinking about the devil and spiritual battle and those kind of things were were hard maybe maybe you hadn't thought about that much before I, I hope that you see beyond uh, being maybe a little shuddered at that I hope you see that God will deliver you from the fire just like he did Shadrach Meshach and Abednego God will equip you God has equipped you for his purpose and plan for you and for the fiery trials that will come to you. And he says, suit up. Some would think the church has gotten too sophisticated to talk about things like the devil and hell and the enemy of our souls and the spiritual darkness and evil. And of course, an enemy who hates you would love for you to minimize or marginalize him so you don't see him coming. Don't do that. If you don't know Christ as Savior, then, then you are naked and exposed by your sin. The simple question is, what will you do about it? How will you respond? And if you say you have put on Christ, have you put that behind you? Have you put off the old you to put him on? Are you living in his joy? Are you equipped and suited up and serving him? That's what we're going to be thinking about over the next eight weeks, and and. And I'm excited to see what God does as we put on this, this armor. And it's a little bit scary in some ways thinking about the battles he may have ahead of us. But like the song says, soldiers of Christ, arise. Go ahead, soldiers of Christ, stand up. A few of you, all of you, all right. Dan, if you guys want to come on up, I'm going to pray. If you have a need this morning, if, if you know that you've been in the battle but you've not suited up, so you know that the equipment's there, but you haven't done anything with it, then I want to encourage you, if you want somebody to pray with you, I'll be up here. Uh, Mike West is in the back. We've got other people that will pray. Um, if, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you are naked and exposed, and I would love to have that conversation with you too. So come on up and let's talk through that. Um, and uh, it's been great to be here with you this morning. All right, let's pray. God, thank you for the way that you love us. God, you didn't just wave, wave your hand and tell us, yeah, you're going you're gonna to have some battles. Good luck with that. God, you equip us. You give us your son. You make a way for us. You tell us repeatedly in your word to put on Christ. You give us examples of what that looks like. And so often... We look in that mirror, as James said, and we walk away and we forget what it looks like. We don't suit up. But praise be to you, God, that you, you continually are our armorer. You are continually equipping us. You are continually laying it before us so that no matter what we face, no temptation has come to us Except what is common to man, but God is faithful. That in a time of testing provides a means of escape. 
Lord, you always equip us, protect us. And for your glory, God, not, not our gain necessarily, but for your glory. And so, Lord, I pray that we, as we suit up, that we, we live for your glory. We love for your glory. We reflect the love of your son for your glory. Thank you for being with us here this morning, God. I pray that, Holy Spirit, that you've opened the eyes of our hearts to see what it is that your word would have for us and that we go out of here as disciples. In Jesus' name, amen.